We all have time. We all have time. What you've done wrong is that you you didn't prioritize yourself. You didn't prioritize that, look, mother, I got to get up and win this war today against myself. I need to look better. I need to feel better. I need to eat better. I need to prioritize time. Or I got to run 100 miles on broken feet. Or you got to do Whatever that. Whatever it is. That's it. What do you think is the biggest stumbling block that most people face with this kind of journey? Honestly, is they have the woe is me mentality. It's too hard. Life isn't fair. These things in life are, are, are not easy for me. You, you, you look to your left and you look to your right and you start to judge yourself off other people. Like if you're a female, well, she's skinny and she doesn't work out as hard as I do. And everything starts to corrupt your mind. You start to look around too much at other people and what they're doing. And that starts to corrupt your own dialogue. We are judging ourselves against too many people. You have to judge yourself against yourself. And that's the one thing I started learning, man. This isn't a race against me and Rich Roll. This is a race against David Goggins and David Goggins alone. And once you can silence all that bullshit, all the outside interference and things that are attracting your mind to everything, you can then start to grow in realizing I'm stressed out for no reason. This is my own little race. This is my own timeline. And this is how I'm going to run it. What's your definition of greatness? Mom, you know what? My definition of greatness is this. It's not a definition, it's an example. Mm. This is greatness, true greatness. Let's say that I'm the greatest tennis player of all time. Okay, let's say that. I hate tennis. Yeah. <laughs> let's say I'm the greatest tennis player of all time. And I did 22 years. I run all the Grand Slams. I have all the. I beat Roger Federer. I'm, I am the best ever. And we're having an interview, and you're talking about my greatness, mm -hmm. what I achieved. And I'm retired. Don't play tennis anymore. Haven't touched a racket in years. And you're making me go back through my life. You're kissing my butt about how great I sure. am. Sure. And I'm answering your questions. Every question I'm answering it. I'm with you. But in the back of my mind, all I'm thinking about is all the times I could have won those matches that I lost by not bringing my best mindset. Mm. You're haunted by all the opportunities that you missed by not bringing your best at that time. When you could have won, but you didn't win because you allowed life to interfere yeah. with that one shot. When you're sitting there getting ready to serve for the match, and your mind is not thinking about where that ball placement needs to be, but it's thinking about your family this, or this at work, or that at work. Mm -hmm. That's greatness. Greatness is your recall on every single shot wow. that you missed throughout a 20-some year career. Every shot, you can go back and say, I was here. This person was in the red shirt there. Greatness is being so aware of the time of life in the second that went by, and you can recall it like it was yesterday. Greatness is being able to go back there, not making that same mistake again, and being haunted by it. That is greatness. Is you have to always be willing to work. I don't follow people who talk about what they used to do in life. I don't give a f what you used to do. I don't care that you know you used to be the bass I don't care. What are you doing today? You may not be that person now, but what are you still doing to try to excel in life? And a lot of people now are talking. I hear so much talk. I don't hear a lot of work. I hear a lot of people telling you what you should be doing, how you should be doing it, how you should be living. And I look at them and you're fat, you're out of shape, you look but you're telling them mother how to live. No, man, I want to listen to you. There's so many people speaking this and that's what bothered me a lot in the military. There's a lot of people talking shit. I don't see the real suffering behind it, behind what you're saying. That's everybody said, man, you talk with so much passion because it's a real place. It sucks to get up in the morning time. It was raining like cats and dogs. I want to get my shoes on and go run. But guess what? I got my shit on and ran. <laughs> yeah. Got that mother. Fear on and ran. is like is the vision that's coming into my mind. <clears throat> 
is Jake is Jake LaMotta at the end of Raging Bull when he's all fat and he's staring at himself and in his own lack of accountability mirror, right? right? Like drunk and talking about the good old days. Right. There are no good old days, man. There are no good old days. Yeah. You got you to gotta go back and, and, and use it for strength, man, but it's where you're at now. You are your own hero. You are your own leader. You are your own master. And I, that is a big one because we idolize so many people mm -hmm. and we want to be them. We want to be someone else. And in doing that, you lose all the potential of who you are. You mimic, you be them, you are them, you become them and you lose you. And we look up to so many people in this world who will let us down. We're humans. I'm going to let you down. You're going to let somebody down. And you put them on a pedestal, you then lose time when that person comes up and lets you down. Mm -hmm. You must hold yourself accountable and being your own hero, that's what that does. You make yourself so totally accountable for who you are. You focus on you and only on you to become the best person you could be for others. Because we leave a lot on the table, not searching who we are. Mm. And then therefore, you die not knowing your greatest potential. Right. Never pick the easy road. Mm. Never, never. And it always goes back to kind of that, the hero mentality. Never pick the easy road, ever in your life. That is the one road that is doom. It is doom. If you want something like six minute abs, all mm -hmm. these different things, yeah. if you want it so fast, mm. you're, you may achieve what you wanted, but you want the permanent fix. The permanent fix comes from the hard road. The hard road gives you permanent results. Mm. The easy road gives you the quick fix. You will go back to where you started on the easy route. That hard route is so permanent that it ends up callousing you everywhere. Everywhere. You keep a six pack forever. You keep, yeah. it. <laughs> you keep it. Because you know the work that goes yeah. into it. Yeah. When you get to where you want to go in life, you finally get there, you finally reach that point, and you're there, and you're happy as hell. Realize this you're not there yet. Mm -hmm. You get that feeling that you arrived. Be afraid. Right. Be truly afraid. Because now you start to do this. Slowly die. Slowly yeah. die. Either you're getting better or you're getting worse. You're not staying the same. Yeah. So when you get to where you think the journey is ended, and you're sitting back and you're like, I arrived. I'm on Mount Everest. I climbed 29, 0, 29. <laughs> yeah. The best thing to do is fall back down that damn mountain as fast as you can and start climbing. Find the next climb. Find the next climb. Yeah. So my mind starts to get weak and we start to forget about how bad we are. So basically what I do here is you have to make sure that your mind doesn't become spastic. Mm -hmm. When it's suffering, when it's in pain, all it wants to do is find the easy way out, which is usually quit. Mm -hmm. If you quit, the pain goes away immediately. Yeah. You gotta give yourself enough energy and fuel in your mind to stay just a little bit longer so you can talk yourself into staying for the whole thing. Yep. And this is how it works. Most of us never start anything cold. If you're gonna go to college, you gotta study your ass off. If you wanna run a 100 mile race, a marathon, if you wanna go be Mr. Olympia, what happens is in that moment when we need self-talk, when we're failing and we're in our worst spot possible, yep. we forget the front end, the, all the build up to where we're at today. We forget how, how much work we put in. We forget that we put years, yeah. years, maybe not into making these dials, but to getting where you're at today. To become this person. To become this person, to be in a position to make this money you want to make, whatever you want to do in your life. Yeah. We forget that. We forget that journey on what it took for us to get in this moment to make the right decision. Yeah. So that's my self talk is this. Okay, I want to get the out of here, man. I'm done. Then I remember this. You ran 2,000 miles training to be in this moment right now. Mm -hmm. We forget that. Yep. 
We forget the three o'clock in the morning runs or, or getting up early for work or whatever you're doing. We forget all that. In that moment of suffering, I remind myself, yeah. I only have 50 more miles. I put in six months of training. So what I do, my self-talk is basically going back down memory lane yeah. of all those f***ed up days. I ran the rain or I had to study real late at night and I didn't want to do it, but I did it to get here. I wanted to get here. Yeah. Now you're here and now you want to quit. Yeah. So you got to be mindful, but this, but this thing about it, if you haven't put in any hard work to reflect on, you're f yeah. all this, all this like people want to be all positive, all this positive talk, it doesn't work if it's a lie. Like if you didn't study for your big exam mm -hmm. and you go into it saying, I'm going to pass it. Yep. No, you're not. Yeah. You're going to fail it. Yeah. That self-talk is not going to work. Self-talk without real work is just a lie. Yeah. So my self-talk is me reminiscing back on the struggle to get to this moment. Yeah. And that tells me we're not quitting today. Yeah. Not yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. You have to go to a different focus. The, the focus has to be so heightened that very few people they even understand that, but they have it in them. They have it in them to go there but you have to go to a place of fear, of suffering, of pain, of doubt. And that's when your mind, if it, if it knows it's not gonna quit, it opens up. And once it opens up, that's my 40% rule. Once you can open, open your mind up when it knows it's not gonna quit, it finds more. It finds more focus, it finds more power, it finds more drive. Once you come face to face with who you are, you have a starting point. All right, <laughs> I'm not real smart. I have no courage. I have no self-esteem. I have no nothing. Nothing. That's my starting point. Now we can move from there. But if I tell myself I'm strong, I have courage, I'm smart, and all these are lies, you continuously push that starting point backwards. Right. So that starting point is the truth. The no bull truth that only you can tell yourself. So it's the starting point. The truth is the starting point. And most people are surrounded by people that don't tell them the truth. No. Because we, it's too painful. It is. Especially nowadays in this society, we like to surround ourselves. It makes us feel so good. Those people who say, it's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. It isn't okay, man. And I, and I get it. Society's changing. And we love to feel wanted and loved. Trust me. That's all important. It right. is. But... You have to have the truth from people. Hey, you're not working your butt off hard enough. You're not trying hard enough. We all think we're trying hard, but what are you gauging that off of? What is making you a quitter? What is making you a weak man? What is making you afraid? And so that's why I kept on quitting and going back to start or not knowing how to get through hard times. And that's why I was telling people, I'm not a theorist. I didn't study, like, you know, I didn't study a book. I literally put myself in a fire repeatedly like a sword. You put a sword in a fire repeatedly and repeatedly. If, if you keep on doing that, you're going to get a nice sword. And then you keep on beating it. You got to beat the out of it. <laughs> and that's what I am. Yeah. I, I became that. I, I, I said, okay, we, we, we can't quit. We got to figure out why you are the Why are you the man? What is wrong with you? What's going on here? So I kept on putting the sword back in the daggone fire. And I just beat it harder. And I beat it harder. Before I knew it, I started realizing, hmm, all right, man, the brain is starting to get hard. The brain is starting to get hard. I'm no longer a theorist. I'm now a practitioner. I put it in hell. I dissected it while it's in hell because you can't dissect anything in a normal environment. You can't dissect anything in 72 degree weather. You must put it in the freezer and freeze the out of it and then you dissect it dissect it when it's miserable dissect the brain when all it's thinking about is i need to get out of here man i want to get out of the freezer open the door and you said nah five more seconds man five more seconds in the freezer and that's when you start to pick that brain apart and that's what all this stuff did to me i kept on putting myself back into the freezer or the fire and beating the out of myself mentally and physically before i knew it this is what happened. Learn from yourself, learn from life, learn from your failures, learn from your insecurities, learn from your self-doubt, 
Don't just say, I'm afraid to jump off an airplane. Mm. What makes you afraid of it? Study it. That's why I studied my mind. Why I became so powerful in the mind is because I realized I was weak. So instead of running away from the mind, I dove into it and said, what is making me weak? Oh, this makes sense. I came from hell. I came from a place that beat me down to nothing, which is why I'm afraid. All this makes sense. So systematically, one by one, I went back and met every single person in my mind, every situation. I went one-on-one -on -one with them again in my mind. I said, okay, let's now revisit this. And that's how you do it. That's how it works. Because your mind chooses the path of least resistance. Your mind has the ultimate tactical advantage over you. It knows what scars you. It, it, it knows your fears. It knows your insecurities and it protects you. That's why I talk about the 40% rule in my book. The 40% rule is all about the brain has the tactical advantage over you. It knows and it, it keeps you away from all that. That's why it says don't jump out of an airplane. Don't go in the ocean where there's sharks. It's a protective mechanism. Don't go back to the place where your dad beat the shit out of you in your mind. Don't go back. The brain protects you, but protects you so much it doesn't allow growth. So the brain is an amazing thing, but the brain controls you. You must control it. You must take power over your own mind or your mind will guide you into all the soft spites, soft places that your brain wants to live in. Mm. Your brain has enough information. It doesn't want to go through that process of, of mind hardening. It doesn't want to do that. I got to remember what time I got to be here, what time I got to be there. This is where I want to stay. I'm peaceful. It wants to stay very peaceful and away from scarring. So that's, that's, that's what it is, man. I believe that most human beings are only living at about 40% of their capability. So the mind has a governor, like a car. If you're driving a car and the car has a governor on it, the car may say 130 miles an hour, but the governor is set for 91. Once that governor sets in, you get to 91, that car starts doing this. The car wants to go. The car wants to go, but that factory said, uh-uh, we're not going past 91. We have a factory, a nice governor in our brain, and it's a survival mechanism. It protects us from pain and suffering. The second we feel that, shit, our mind says, oh no, this isn't fun. We should back off. We should sit down, find something more comfortable. And there's something about the mind. The mind has the tactical advantage over you at all times. At all times of your life, the mind has a tactical advantage over you. Why is that? It knows what you're afraid of. It knows your insecurities. It knows your deep, dark lies. And it starts to push you away from that. It pushes you in a direction that is comfortable. The mind controls everything. So what I realized was that when I was growing up and I was 300 pounds and I got all fat and I got all insecure, I realized that my mind kept taking me in this direction, when things got uncomfortable for me, when I was facing my insecurities, when I was facing my fears, my mind said, oh no, we have a tactical advantage. We need to get you, separate you from this feeling. This feeling over here, life's all about feelings. We want the happy feeling. We don't want that feeling of this sucks. Why am I here? And you don't have any, so, so you can't answer those questions, so you leave. I started realizing that if in that moment, you can answer those up questions and you are now in charge of your brain versus your brain ruling you that's where all that stuff comes from so 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 the 40 percent rule is all of that you get to 40 percent your brain says we're done let's roll man this is starting to get painful this is uncomfortable so you sit down you have to figure out ways and everybody's different that's how the book kind of talks about like we all have these things about you know five steps to this and, and four steps to this it's, it's a lot more than that that's all bull. It's, it's a practice that you have to, it's a habit. So if you know that at 40%, I'm still, you know, I'm feeling pain. At 40%, I'm feeling pain. That's where the 40% rule kicks in. Now it starts. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling pain. My mind's saying all this shit to me. It's saying, get out of here, run, flee. The fight or flight kicks in. Okay, we're done. We're not good enough. It starts telling you all these things. You start to believe it because the mind controls all. This is the time where you have to gain control back of your mind. It's okay, let me see if I can go 45%. And once you start giving yourself more and more hope and start realizing, okay, 
the mind starts to be, okay, wh what are you doing? We're supposed to be going right and you're going left. You start then controlling your mind, start finding more in, you know, in yourself. And then it goes from 40% to a lot further than that. But that's the start of it though. Get to, get to the spot where your mind is saying stop. Wherever that is, you gotta get there first. And then that's when that starts to work for you. You gotta control yourself in that moment. Uh, you said two things which I think need to be explored. One is that you created this alter ego, Goggins, mm -hmm. which I think is insanely powerful and it reminds me of Eminem talked about the same thing with creating Slim Shady, was it was the way, he, once he had the persona, he could face his fears and he could get up. Um, and then the other thing was, you said you need to shut the f up and listen. Mm -hmm. But talking about just to yourself, like not to try to get a distraction, not social media, not TV, nothing. Like go in a room by yourself and really listen. How do those two things, the, the creation of the alter ego and that listening to the, the sort of dark, hateful things that you're probably saying to yourself, how do those work together? So a lot of people can live with themselves. That's the first thing. A lot of people can live with themselves, look in the mirror and say, I'm okay with being afraid. I'm okay with going on this easy highway over here. The easy highway has all these signs and directions how to get somewhere. And you have to first be uncomfortable with how you feel about yourself with that voice that a lot of us like to run away from. We all have it. We all have that voice that's saying, hey man, you know, you're, you're kind of wimping out right now. You're kind of being a little punk right now. But a lot of us say, okay, that's okay. It's okay to tell these little white lies to ourselves. So we first have to face the real you. The real me is David Goggins. The real me is the guy looking at you right now saying, I don't want to be on this show right now because I used to stutter as a kid. And I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid that here in a second, I'm gonna start stammering and stuttering and the whole world is going to know that I have all these issues. But that's when I see right now, okay Goggins, you got to go on this show. That's Goggins. Goggins is saying, okay David Goggins, you're a punk. Life made you this way. We can't live like this. We can't live in fear. We can't live in judgment. We can't be afraid of what the fuck people right now are looking at me saying about me. We cannot be afraid of that. That's Goggins. Goggins saying, all of you who don't like me, who don't want to, and that person then comes in. But you have to be David Goggins and say, man, I'm afraid of this. I'm up here. Life made me this way here. I stutter. I, I have these issues with, with, with uh, reading and writing and, and I'm, I'm, I'm fat and I'm insecure. You have to face that in that dark room. In that dark room is who you are. But in that dark room is where you have to create another human being that walks out of that dark room to face who you are. That's the only way you're gonna get over all those things. You have to create someone else. Not like you have two different personalities, it is you. But you have to find strength. And that visualization of almost me cracking out Goggins, like almost like that Superman cape, like, like, like I'm coming out a different person, a person that doesn't give a about anything, who doesn't care about being judged, who knows I'm weak, who knows I'm afraid, who says, whatever you think about me, take it, whatever, I'm here. That's guidance. In the dark room, you face yourself, you realize you wanna be better, you realize you don't wanna be this weak, insecure person in the world who has all these problems that we all have. We all have. Social media is a great platform to tell you who we wanna be, not who we are. So that's where that dark room is. When I started overcoming myself, I started getting around these real alpha males, these hard, hard men. And I always put people way above me when I was growing up. Like, my God, they had to have a lot more than me to get to where they're at. And a lot of them did. But once you get around the, the best of the best of the best people, you can kind of start breaking them down and realize, man, you, you're just as f***ed up as me. Like, like we all have. <laughs> but all you did was you hit it better. You're... you're your upbringing, your mom and dad, your society, the way you were raised, it hit it better than, than, than mine. You weren't the only black kid, or there was like five, in a, in a school. You know, I can't hide. Going through buds, I was the only black kid. You can't hide. But I started realizing, just because I look different than you, a lot of you can't hide either. So it started giving me courage to watching people that we all have a story. We all have a jacked up life in one way or another. Some of us don't have the guts to talk about it, though.
And that's where I found the guts to talk about mine. Well, there's some there's purity in physical pursuits, right? Because it doesn't matter what your social status is. It doesn't matter how people perceive you. When it when it comes down to how long can you stay in that pool? When it comes down to how far can you run? Right. When it comes down to how much can you push yourself past the part where you want to quit? Right. How far can you keep going? There's a purity in that that it, it, it dissolves social order, all that bull. It, all the what people think about you goes out the window. It's what who who are you right now? That's right. Who are you right now? That's a true statement, man. And I look at it as, as, as psychological warfare, and that's where I started learning that that life is one big psychological warfare that you play on yourself. You play on yourself, man. The most important conversation I ever had my with, is, is with myself, and the shit I was telling myself was so tough. It was so wrong. It was so misguided, and other people start to write that dialogue for you also. And it starts to be what you say to yourself every single day. And I started creating a whole nother warfare, a whole nother battle started becoming. I was like, oh, hang on a second, Goggins. You have these tools. You have these tools. Your life was basically the perfect, the perfect grounds for training for where you need to go in your life. All the beatings, all the, all the bullying, all the, you know, you going through uh, learning disabilities, all the struggles. It was the absolute perfect training ground for you to go to where you need to go. And that's how I start looking at my life versus woe is me, poopy pants, kick a rock down the street mentality. It was nah. God just hooked you right up. He hooked you right up, man, with the perfect place. You were training for the first 18, 19, 20 years. You were training for this stuff, man. You had the advantage of everybody else versus my God, they're so above me. They came from a great family. Mom and dad love them. They didn't have a learn, they didn't stutter, they didn't struggle. No, man, your struggle is what made you who you are now. So I started flipping this into a whole different, I started being a master of what I was scared of. I was scared of my mind. And I became a, literally a master of that mind. And that's what now, from now on, it sets me apart from most people. I started diving into that. Well, that is a, a big part of the story is when you go over your childhood and, you know, your abusive father and then having this great guy that was going to become your stepdad and then he gets murdered. It's like right when you're about to get out of it, everything right. looks good. Boom. And then he gets murdered. It's like these things really did sort of set you up to start from scratch again and just go, okay, roger that. We start from scratch. Right. And now you have that attitude. You developed it through all of these horrible personal experiences all the trials and tribulations all the evil sh that people try to do to you that sort of set you up to be able to deal in right. a way that a lot of people can't well i used to look at my life from a different vantage point and when you're when you're in all the muck and you're just walking in muck and walking in muck and walking in muck you don't see that if you look off to the left of the muck there's a sidewalk brother get off get off of it you, you have your head down looking in this muck once i saw the sidewalk got the sidewalk i got a little break and i got a different vantage point and then from the sidewalk i found a cliff then i found a mountain i got way up high on top of my life and looked back down on it and said okay i gotta figure this out man i'm not going anywhere i'm starting to lie i'm starting like so when you have a messed up foundation i started lying about everything i wanted people to like me i wanted to be accepted in some society of life some social society and i, and I I was like, man, this isn't the right way. I messed up here, I messed up here, I messed up everywhere. And so I realized the worst thing that happened to me is I lost myself. I never had myself, I never found myself. I had no self-esteem. So I knew through working out and through learning, because it, it took a lot for me to learn also, I started finding self-esteem. Once I found that, that's when doors started opening up. I, started, I stopped caring about people, that what they thought, being judged, wow, if I say this, if I started right now, are you going to make fun of me? I stopped caring about that. And that's when my life started really changing for me, slowly but surely. That, and that's such an important point when you're talking about the working out. Because a lot of people, when they think about working out, they think of it as being a physical thing. Right, no, no. I did it for mental. Yeah. People always say, my God, like, no. Don't, don't look at it like, I didn't care about losing weight. I didn't care about being the fastest person. I didn't care about, I wasn't making the Olympics. I wasn't going to pros. I could barely read and write when I was in a, a junior in high school. I wasn't going anywhere. I saw working out as a way for me to build calluses on my mind. I had to callous over the victim's mentality. So I watched these movies. I, you know, I talked about Rocky last time I was on here. I always equated training to mental toughening. Like 
it always looked brutal. People waking up early and doing all these things. And it, looked, it looked horrible. I was like, wow, man, I got to start doing that. Not to get better, bigger, and stronger, but that is what's going to build me. That looks uncomfortable. That looks brutal. And getting up early, I don't want to do that. So I made this long list of things that I don't want to do. And through that, I found myself. I started get, like, I'm like, you guys aren't doing this in high school. You guys aren't getting up at five o'clock in the morning, running over here in this golf course. So I started seeing myself very differently than, than the average human being. I was like, hang on a second. I have something they don't have. And that's when I started to develop these things through working out. It was this great, never ending work ethic. And through work ethic, I developed self-esteem. Now, is this something that you learn? Is this something you learn yourself from, from exercise yourself? Or is this something you had read or heard about? Like what made you equate this doing this and doing these difficult things physically to mental toughness to being this is the discipline that you need in order to get your life out of the situation you're in so i never read anything you know i, I could barely read you know so right. i wasn't reading back then i just saw i watched a lot of movies and i was really big into visualization and um i always equated working out to struggle and i struggled my whole life but i ran from it so I started realizing, man, I got to start facing the struggle and I got to be mentally strong for the struggle. So that's why I started kept coming up with like, I, I'm training for life. Mentally, I'm training for life. I'm not training for like to, to lift 400 pounds. And I found out on my own pretty much is that through this, through, through discipline, through self-discipline, through repetition, through tons of repetition, the same thing that you don't want to do. And that's, the, and that's the key thing. Through repetition, the things you don't want to do, you develop mental uh, like an armor for your mind start to armor your mind Cause your mind's like okay we suffer we suffer every day it's what we do we do stuff that sucks every day so then when the suck stuff comes you're ready for it and that's how it started coming up you know i just started being very uncomfortable and now I'm, it's like a just a way of life it's a crazy thing to figure out though it's like that you figured it out and you didn't just figure it out you embraced it like when you were talking about your senior year of high school when you're talking about your your mirror being your accountability mirror like you had a radical shift mm -hmm. like you just decided to not be a f loser right. and to start tightening up and start holding yourself accountable and and get ready for things so i had this my whole life i mean i don't know if people believe in god or what i don't care what you believe in there's been this unrelenting voice in my head we all have this voice it's the right or wrong voice and a lot of times that voice guides us into comfort and my voice guided me into comfort a lot, but I had this other voice I heard my whole life saying, hey, mother, what are you doing? No, nah, man, we got to go over here. We got to go over here to, to that rock pile over in the corner where nobody's at. That's, that's where victory's at. So a lot of you know that my knees are messed up, but that doesn't mean you don't stop going. You don't stop pushing. Life's about improvise, adapt, and overcome to every situation that's in front of you. A lot of people hate that message that I say continue pushing, continue finding your new 100%, continue finding your best self. If you don't like that message, this is not the place to be. I'm about people trying to find the best they have, not making excuses, overcoming any and all obstacles. So today, I can't run. I can't do much. But you can guarantee one thing. David Goggins got the after. He got the after. I don't get my knees don't work. I'll find something else that does. Ha <laughs> ha! Stay hard. One of the keys to my success in life was I was able to see myself at the end of a very difficult task before I even started it. When I was 297, out of shape and afraid of water, I was able to see myself at graduation as a Navy SEAL. But as time went on, I kept on getting rolled back to day one. And every day got longer and longer. So what I had to do was I had to take this big chunk and make it small. So I became the master of the one day that I was living. We have to do that now. We don't know when the end is coming to this. So we got to master that one day. It may keep on getting pushed back day after day. If you master that day and want to be harder and stronger, you'll figure it out. So I came up with a thing called Taking Souls in my book. I started to devise ways to break a soul. 
of a human being, of, a, of an object, of, of, of whatever's in front of me. If you keep on attacking something, nothing wants to stand in front of anything that is relentless. Nothing. The taking soul part of the book is really interesting because uh, you talked about like the, the mind shift that you had when you were in Buds. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was a, that's an intense part of the book. It's, it is. Uh, that's when a lot of stuff started clicking, man. I started watching those instructors on the side. Because, you know, there's, there's three shifts. There's eight instructors, three shifts. Because, you know, the guys going through, through Hell Week, they're up all day and all night for 130 hours. This is the promised land of mental hardening for me. I love this place. And you have the instructors who, who you, know, you know, they've been there, done that. Now they're instructing you. So they do their eight-hour shift. They have their parkas on. It's usually cold, coffee, drinking their coffee. And they're beating the crap out of us. And when I started realizing, I started playing mind games. And I was like, you know what? I bet these are looking at us, judging themselves about when they were going through Hell Week. About, let me see, I'm looking at Goggins right now. I was better than him. I was better than that guy. I was better than that guy over there. And I was like, okay, okay. You got to judge me, right? <laughs> All right. So what I started doing was I got my boat crew, boat crew two. It's in the book. It's a great, great story. I said, come here, guys. You can't break boat crew two. You can't break boat crew two. <laughs> so it's Wednesday, it's Wednesday, and everybody's broken. Everybody's beat up, man. And, and like this, I mean, you start moving like a robot. Everybody's like just kind of just trying to get through Helwick now, and your energy's zapped. And they know Wednesday's like that over the hump. I love that you talked about that in the book, too, that they put it in your head. That oh, yeah. Wednesday, you're going to be tired. Oh, yeah. And that's another thing. They, they tell you how you're supposed to feel. So... You are feeling that way. I was like, uh, -uh. don't let these mother tell you how you're supposed to feel. No, it's day one, mother. This is hour one. So I was getting my boat crew all jacked up. I said, we're going to take these mother souls. So when they had us doing this simple thing that guys are struggling with, boat crew two is just launching the boat in here, yelling, yeah, you can't hurt us. You can't hurt boat crew two. And I looked on the instructor's faces and it looked like someone had just with their soul. And I looked at my guys in my book and I said, hey, guess what? Those mother aren't in the night. We own <laughs> space in their head. We own space. They're going to think about us tonight. When I was in the military, I loved my schedule because I knew I had to be at work at 7 o'clock. So you better get your ass up at 4 o'clock, man. You got to get your shit in, brother. Because I had to get my shit before I got my shit. Right. You know? So that was my mentality back then, man. You know, like I, I had to get the miles and get everything in, man, and, and get to work, man. I'm uh, competing with the alpha males. I was that guy who grinded. I grinded hard. I mean, I, I grinded hard. I was that guy who was up, like if we went on an op or we had a, a workup, let's say we had a workup, we were at an island, we're out there shooting guns and, and, and doing land warfare. And we did it till like one o'clock in the morning. Most everybody would go to sleep. I didn't go to sleep. I went to the gym and I worked out. Or I'd go sleep, and I said we'd be up at 5 o'clock. I was up at 4 o'clock and got my hour in. I made sure to always do that. When you're around alpha males, um, you're sometimes picking a fight, you know, all the time. And I look different. I acted different. I was different. I am different. I take a lot of pride in that. And so, you know, if, if you didn't get after it, I didn't respect you. Because I believe that, you know, where, where I'm at, I, I know that human potential is what we have. It's all we have. It's what we, the, the world sees us a certain way. And when I saw that people weren't doing that, I had a funky ass fucking attitude. I come back from Ranger School, a big time leader. I was a big time leader. I got honor man out there. I led by example. And what I realized a lot of times when you're in these schools, these schools, people want to graduate these schools because they suck. They don't want to ever go back to these schools. Mm. Those schools became my life. People don't want to see a guy that wants to go back to day one, week one of Navy SEAL training every day of your life. And that's how I live. And it's a disgusting human being that I can be. <laughs> it is. And, and a lot of people didn't like me. A lot, a lot of people started some stupid and started saying this and that. The bottom line, man, is my resume says it all, man. My resume is out there. Google the mother. You say whatever you want to say about me, man. I, I, I miss some diplomas, man, for having, you know, two heart surgeries and people try to start some rumors on me, man. You started rumors on me, man, because I fucking got the after it. And real hard guys, like a guy named Hawk I talk to all the time. Yeah, 
He's a great friend of mine. When the heart's my first, before my heart surgery, my second heart surgery, I went on a 10 mile ruck run. Before my second heart surgery, the day of it, I went on a 10 mile ruck run, 50 pounds. I saw that guy. He's like, what the are you doing out here? We got heart surgery. It's Roger that, brother. I'm getting it in before I'm be out for about six months after the heart surgery. That was my mentality. Because I started realizing at a young age what I was leaving on the table. And once I found out what a human being is capable of, I didn't know how to control that. I was a, I was a, you want to talk about a savage? That's what I was. I was a f straight up. People talk about savage very lightly. I was from the back woods, mother savage, dude. You know, and, and I just, I was just, I was, I told you what I thought. I, 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 had, I had eight chips on my shoulder. I, um, and a lot of times that wasn't great. So is it a situation where like with the SEALs where once you've gotten through buds, and once you've gotten through all the, the physically grueling parts of getting to be accepted, once you're in, then you were imposing standards that they didn't want to they didn't want to keep up with. I, w I would say some people, you some know, people. I, I had uh, I had one platoon that I had a problem with, you know, like I like I, I, I graduated Ranger School and I, and I got in this platoon and. I didn't see out of how I was in charge of a PT program, and you put me in charge of the PT program is <laughs> your ass. And the thing about it is, I didn't like it either. Mm. I didn't. I didn't want to do that either, man. But what were you making them do? Like you know, like I it was it was some navy it was, it was some budget. You know, we went back to buds like you know log PTs and you know, carrying logs over the berms and shit. Like, I had us do like pull ups, rope climbs, pull up like for like for like an hour. So imagine doing a, a rope climb, and then go over and do like ten to fifteen pull ups coming back. And we, we would do like these, they were very hard workouts. Like there was no like, go to the gym, lift some weights type of shit. And I was imposing my own mentality on everybody. These are grown ass men. They, you, know, you know, they don't want to be what I'm trying to make them to be. And when they called me off, like, hey, you know, we're not in seal, you know, we're not in buds anymore, Goggins, it pissed me off. And I, uh, and I got a little mad too, got, got my chip and I, I got my ball and, me, me and Sledge went ahead and started to uh, work out together. And we developed this, like, me and Sledge work out like grand animals. And we had this mentality of, fuck, yeah, we're getting after it every day. And, and everybody else kind of did their own thing, man. And I just, that's when I started looking at people, you know, not just SEALs, but people very differently, man. Because I bit in to, like, you know, like, to be this special operator. You got to have broken legs and these guys. All those stories. I was the same guy, man. I, I, I put people on a pedestal. I put people like I can never be them. I can never be that guy, man. Never put anybody on a pedestal. That's what happened to me. I put them on a pedestal, and once I got up there with them, and I saw them, and once again, not everybody. Some hard motherfuckers out there, dude. Period. Dot. Hard motherfuckers. I thought every motherfucker was hard. Yeah. Yeah. Uncommon amongst uncommon men. That's all it was about for me, man. And I took it to another level, and I pissed a lot of motherfuckers off. And what they is, were trying to find chinks in my armor then. They were, they, they were trying to find chinks in my armor. You know, all, all he does is run. All he does is f***ing run. That's why, I, you know, but once again, that's why I was talking about the military too much. Like I said, the Air Force loved me. The Army guys I work with loved me. The Ranger School, all that stuff loved me. You know, I wasn't, you know, it, it, it's just what it is, man. It's, uh, I was part of the Navy SEALs. I was, a, I was a team guy, but I wasn't part of the Brotherhood. And that's just me, man. That's just me. You know, I just, I, I think differently. I, I believe differently. Um, and I, I believe strongly in what I believe in. Well, some people must appreciate the fact that you were self-motivated and that you were pushing the envelope, that you were pushing yes. the pace. You were setting a high bar. I'm able to visualize and dream like nobody's business. And I know that I can create a vision that many people can't. And I worked for it. So the vision I had was when Apollo Creed beat the f out of Rocky, beat the shit out of him, he kept fighting. He was a dumb fighter, couldn't read, couldn't, that was me. Couldn't read, couldn't write, just punchy, everything about him. And Rocky beat the or Apollo beat the shit out of him. He was in that corner, and everybody was saying, stay the f down. And him getting up, him getting up, Apollo Creed raised his arms up in the air, turned around, thought he won the fight. He turns around and sees this guy getting up, and it was the face of Apollo Creed that changed my life. The face of Apollo Creed. It was like, just by that mother getting up, not winning, just by him getting the up, 
Apollo Creed was, he was, he was champ. He's the best. Rocky had taken his soul. Had literally taken his soul. His, his head goes down. He looks at him like, who, what the f are you? I want it to be that. Not Rocky. I want to be the guy that people looked at. I don't care if you liked me or didn't like I don't, I don't care. But it said, this mother is going to keep coming after whatever the f is in front of him. I wanted that. I wanted that. I wanted that worse than anything in the world. So that is, I kept picturing me falling down and getting up and every mother that called me, I was dumb. Even myself, even myself, I wanted to feel something besides defeat. I wanted to just go to distance. And that going to distance pushed me to a point of where now I go way past the distance. So you go the first day, you, you run a quarter mile, and then you walk back home, and right. you're, you're, you're upset. How, right. do you, how do you move forward? So basically what I did was I came home, and I, I had a talking milkshake. <laughs> I sat down, and I gave up. I said, this ain't going to happen. Man. I could lose 106 pounds, and I can't even go a quarter of a mile. I started being able to take negative and be happy. And this whole... I say what if a lot, it sounds corny and it sounds weak, but it's true. One of the recruiters said, there's not many black Navy SEALs. Matter of fact, I was the 36th African American SEAL in history. It's in over That's seven crazy. years. Because the water, you know, right. it, I mean, people get mad at me, it's true, just get over it. And so I was like, man, what story would it be if my fat, dumb, Lying to be friends with people, insecure ass, can overcome them. And that what if mentality, like that 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 dreamer mentality, just would always fuel me. It would just fuel me, man. What if I can be, what if I can be a seal, man? What, what if I can go from running a quarter of a mile now? I, now I run two hundred five miles. What, what what if I can go? What, just what if I can go? And 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 what if? How would that feel? If I'm graduating, because I don't forget at the graduation thing I was talking about, 224, the, the, like the video I sat down and watched. This command officer stood up and he said to, to the graduation, um, guys who are graduating buds, like 18 of them. He said, we live in a society where mediocrity is often rewarded. And he went on to say something about these men detest mediocrity. And I wanted to be a man that detests mediocrity. It, all, it, it got me in a lot of trouble in the SEAL teams and going forward in my life because I just, I started looking down on people for not going hard as and I started to create different things, but that's for a different day. But I just believe that, it, you know, my whole mind changed. That is a problem that a lot of people who work hard do have. You get angry at people who don't work hard yes. to the point where you, you know, you want to insult them. You want to, you want to smack them. And it's really because you're scared of seeing that in yourself. Yeah, that's probably the truth. That's probably yeah. the truth. So I, I guess a lot of times in my life I would see people and it probably was a direct reflection of who I was yeah. and I would get mad at them but in reflection it's probably just be getting mad at myself. Yeah, that's for me 100%. When I, when I see people that are half-assed and things, I get terrified of seeing that in myself and I get mad at them. Right. And it's, uh, it's not a good way to handle it. No. You know, but it's, it's natural because mm -hmm. you're just terrified of seeing that trait. Right. And it costs me. So you come back. Mm -hmm. You do the quarter mile, right? You walk back home. How do you regroup? So what I did, I sat down there and I put Rocky in. I got my milkshake, put Rocky. I said, you know what? I was big time in Rocky and Platoon. Why Platoon? I love to see people who were getting beat down. And this, there's, there's scenes. There's scenes that just drove me. And people in my hell weeks, you know, I was in three of them. They'd always hear me singing these songs. These songs, humming these songs in torturous situations when you're, when everybody's quitting this cold, I would be somewhere gone, somewhere gone, if somewhere dark as. Shit. There's a scene in the platoon when Elias, when Barnes shoots Elias, and you know they think Elias is dead, and the choppers are tanking off, and Charlie Sheen's asking, you know, Tom Berenger, where's Elias? Where's Elias? William Defoe? Oh, I found him back there, dead somewhere, and. Through the woods, the Viet Cong is chasing Elias through the woods and is shooting him in his back. And all he wants to do is get to the chopper. He's getting shot in his back. He's getting up. He's getting shot in his back. He's getting up. And you see this guy just fighting. I love the guy who just fights. And so I put these things in as reminders that you're going to have to suffer, man. This 
0.25, man, this is, man, you're going to have to suffer to, 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 to go from this fat, insecure mother to one of the best guys on the planet Earth. This journey is going to take something that is going to be incomprehensible to most people. And these different visualizations, how I visualize them in my self-talk, it became so nasty and dirty that I almost liked the fact that I went 0.25. So it became from being defeated to like, man, all right, mother, maybe you know, maybe the Marvin go 0.75. You know, it just became this different mindset. I turned negatives into positives. When I was in the military, we go on these instructor-led runs. Most of the time, we knew the start and end point. So on the way back, I started seeing people getting happy because the end was near. But there were some instructors that would hear the happiness and go right on past the end point. When that happened, everybody stopped talking. Heads would stop dropping. And I started taking souls. At that time, I knew what happened in their minds. They were living off the hope factor. They hoped the instructors would stop running. They hoped the water was never cold. They hoped the weather was good. I don't live off that hope. I wish the water was cold. I wish them instructors keep on running i wish for rain when the ending is unknown and the distance is unknown that's when you know who the you are stay hard so another year is coming gone and a lot of us are in the same place we were last year what the are you waiting on we sleep one third of our lives and we think we can take days off we think we have the right to sit back and give ourselves options on which way we're gonna go in life. Am I gonna to run today? Am I gonna work out today? Well, it's Christmas. It's New Year's. It's my birthday. Do you think time gives a that it's Christmas, that it's New Year's, that it's your birthday? You're giving yourself too many options. Let me tell you one thing. Time is running out. You keep on sitting around wondering what the want to do you're just gonna run out of time so make sure you do one thing stop following the crowd they may take time off but you can't afford to stay hard growing up my dad did a good job of dehumanizing me he didn't care much how I thought or how I felt so when I saw the military uniform when I was growing up I thought to myself if I can get that uniform on I would find honor in wearing the uniform. So, not only do I want to be in the military, I want to be in special ops. But I realized to be in special ops, you gotta know how to swim. So I got a how-to book on swimming. The first page was easy. Float. So I went to the pool, tried to float. I sank right down to the bottom. I realized I was negative boy in his hell. The more I failed, the more my father's words were creeping to my mind about how I'm not good enough. All this other he said to dehumanize me. As time went on, I started realizing the more I didn't quit, the more self-respect I gained and the power was all mine. In life, it's important to do one thing. Many people will try to dehumanize you. It's up to you to find self-respect and dignity in yourself. You don't need a uniform to have honor. You need to have pride in yourself, dignity. Stay hard. So who I was, I was this nobody guy. Mm -hmm. And I created this Goggins. Mm -hmm. And that Goggins, there's David Goggins and there's Goggins. David Goggins is a calm, cool guy that sits back. Used to be a you know, weak kid. Mm -hmm. Now he's just a normal guy. Mm -hmm. Goggins is a guy that is willing to tape up his legs to go after it. Goggins is who I love. Mm -hmm. Goggins is who I created. My dad created David Goggins. I created Goggins. There's a lot of people out there who 
suffer from low self-esteem. So when you suffer with low self-esteem, you allow weak people to get in your head. So a good way to build that self-esteem up is to get in the gym and change the way you look. And then that changes the way you feel about yourself. But the biggest thing about working out is sometimes the way you look may not be changing that fast. But we lose one thing. We lose the perspective of the training. The training is truly built on changing the mindset. And this world isn't fair. It's fair enough. I see a lot of blacks, whites, women getting after it. Very successful. So where's your excuse? I see a lot of finger pointing, tons of people blaming other people for different One big thing is this, fear. Fear keeps a lot of them from being successful. It keeps you making excuses for yourself. Fear lives one place and one place only. And that's in your mind. Martin Luther King had a dream. Don't let fear f*** yours up. Stay hard. A lot of us dream big. You, you should dream big. Dreaming big is important. You know, some of us want to be doctors, lawyers, dentists. Some of us want, you know, want, want to be in special operations. So you have this big dream. You can see it so clearly like it's right in front of you. You can go out and touch it. But the thing about it is somewhere, if you dream big enough, somewhere down that journey, that dream becomes a mother nightmare. And what happens in that nightmare, you start to have all these questions. Like, if you want to be a special ops, you may not be a great swimmer. You may just realize that I'm not a great swimmer, I'm not a great runner. You may start to fail tests. And all these questions start to flood your mind. Why am I here? I'm not good enough. Trust me, I know all about the questions. They will flood your mind. If you do not have the answers for them, you will quit. The answers lie in the repetitions. You must not forget the repetitions you put into trying to dominate the crap that you're in today. We have two voices in our mind. And boy, I know they're true. I've heard them. I hear them now. <laughs> and they're real. It's that one voice, that voice I used to love to hear, that we love to hear. It's that soft mother That soft mother voice that says, sleep the in. It's okay. It's that coddling voice. You want to be hugged and nurtured and all that shit that says it's going to be okay. Well, there's another motherfucking voice that wakes you up in the middle of the night. It's not your girlfriend. It's not your boyfriend. It's that demon fucking voice that whispers in your fucking ear that says, get up, motherfucker. You're not fucking good enough. You got to work fucking harder. You haven't put enough time in. It's that voice you want to run away from. It's that voice you don't want to here, but guess what? It's that voice you need to listen to. Stay hard, listen to the whisper. Maybe you were a victim of being called fat growing up. Folks make fun of you and Maybe you weren't the smartest in school. And people can't match you for that I'm gonna tell you right now, there's great power in adversity. If you're a victim of any kind, make sure you use that to become successful. Don't look for revenge. Look for the reckoning. And I guarantee you, all those people who you growing up, you might just be the boss. They'll come looking for a favor. And when they do, you got an option to say okay or do what I do and say go yourself. Ha! Be